These were her best friends. She trusted them. It wasn't enough for them to stop being friends with her. They had to kill her. This is one of the more senseless and disgusting things I've ever heard a teenager do. Born on February 10th, 1996, 16-year-old Skylar Neese was the only child of Mary and David Neese. The family lived in a small town called Star City, which is a suburb of Morgantown, West Virginia. At the time, Mary Neese worked as an administrative assistant in a cardiac lab, and David Neese was a product assembler at Walmart. Skylar was a straight-A student at University High School, and she wanted to become a criminal defense lawyer. Her parents described her as being able to read and do math far before many of her classmates. Skylar loved to read, had an active social life, and, like most teens, was all about posting her thoughts on social media. Skylar loved animals and was said to often bring home strays. Like many teenagers, she had her first part-time job in the fast food industry. She worked at Wendy's with two of her close friends and loved her job, to the point where she never missed a day of work. On July 5th, 2012, Skylar returned to her family's apartment after working her scheduled shift that day. At around 12.30 a.m., Skylar left her family's apartment through her bedroom window and crossed the street, getting into a sedan, which was captured on surveillance cameras outside of her family's apartment complex. Skylar left that evening with two girls, Sheila Eddy and Rachel Schof, with whom she attended University High School. Skylar had recently fallen out with the two and was initially hesitant to go with them, but after a series of phone calls and texts from the girls, Skylar changed her mind. Skylar had known Sheila since she was eight years old after meeting at a summer rec program. The two had met Rachel their freshman year. The trio were inseparable, and Skylar was said to have served as an emotional rock for the other two girls, as Sheila and Rachel both had parents who were divorced. Skylar, however, was the only child of her parents, and they wanted everything for her. They nurtured her intelligence and encouraged her to be her own person. According to Skylar's mother, Mary, quote, Skylar thought she could save her. I would hear her on the phone giving Sheila all kinds of hell. Don't be stupid. What were you thinking? On the other hand, Sheila was so much fun. She was always silly and doing crazy stuff, end quote. Sheila, the fun-loving girl of the trio, was accepted by the Neese family as if she was one of their own. Sheila didn't even have to knock on the door when she came to visit Skylar, as she was allowed to just come on in. Rachel, on the other hand, was the opposite of Sheila. Though she was well-liked and enjoyed being in school plays, she came from a strict Catholic family and idolized Sheila for her somewhat wild and carefree attitude. While Rachel and Skylar enjoyed some of the freedom that Sheila enjoyed, they didn't have that same freedom to the same extent, and that particular dynamic would eventually begin to cause a rift which would play out on social media. It appeared to Skylar, based on her post and through friends that corroborated this at school, as though Sheila and Rachel were becoming closer friends without her. So according to classmate Daniel Hovatter, quote, Sheila and Skylar were fighting a lot. One time sophomore year, me and Rachel were at a practice for Pride and Prejudice, and Rachel had her phone up to her ear and she was laughing. Sheila and Skylar were fighting, but Skylar didn't know Sheila had put it on a three-way calling and Rachel was listening in, end quote. But this wouldn't be the only thing that would cause a rift within the group. It's been alleged that despite having boyfriends of their own, Sheila and Rachel had become more than just friends, and there was some fear that their secret would be leaked. On one occasion, it was alleged that the two even locked Skylar in a bedroom with them while they hooked up. Another source claimed that Skylar had filmed such an encounter between the two girls and planned to leak the film. Earlier on the afternoon of July 5th, Skylar took to social media to throw more barbs directed at the two. Quote, sick of being at home. Thanks, friends. Love hanging out with you all, too. End quote. The day before, Skylar posted, quote, you doing things like this is why I can never completely trust you. End quote. But that evening, things took a darker turn. This wasn't going to be any normal joyride with friends. Sheila and Rachel had far more sinister plans in mind. In fact, they had been plotting it for months. The two teens left Rachel's house with kitchen knives, paper towels, bleach, cleaning cloths, a change of clean clothes, and a shovel. Even though it was a balmy summer evening, the two wore hoodies to hide the fact that they were carrying knives on them and hid the rest of what they called their kill kit in the trunk of Sheila's car. Tragically, Skylar's ill-fated tweet was correct. 
She couldn't ever completely trust the two. Rachel and Sheila had planned to kill her. The three girls then headed northwest from Star City toward Blacksville via U.S. Route 19. They had planned to travel along West Virginia Route 7, but turned around after spotting a state police car parked in front of a gambling lounge. They eventually arrived at their destination just across the Pennsylvania state border, a spot where all three girls would occasionally go to smoke. Once the girls were out of the vehicle, the perpetrators told Skylar they had forgotten to bring a lighter. Skylar volunteered to go back to the vehicle to fetch her own lighter. Once Skylar had turned her back, Rachel and Sheila counted to three, their agreed-upon signal, then began to stab Skylar. She attempted to run but was only able to run a few feet before Rachel tackled her to the ground and continued to attack her. Skylar managed to wrestle Rachel's knife from her and, in an apparent attempt to defend herself, she cut Rachel's knee. Sheila continued to stab Skylar until there was complete silence and, according to Rachel, Skylar's neck stopped making gurgling sounds. In her dying breaths, after being stabbed dozens of times, Skylar's final words consisted of a single question. Why? Rachel and Sheila dragged Skylar to the side of the road and looked for a place to bury her body, but the road ran along a creek and the soil there was too hard and rocky to dig a hole. They instead covered Skylar with rocks, fallen branches, and dirt, and shut her cell phone off. They washed up in a nearby creek, returned to the car to change their clothes, and then left the scene, disposing of the clothes they wore that was soaked with Skylar's blood, and then returned to their homes. It should also be noted there is a source that states that Sheila and Rachel disposed of the clothing in a lake after Rachel was going on a boating trip with her family the following day. But that's just the legend. We haven't really heard much about that in other sources. Now, Cole Bartiromo, I'm hoping I'm saying his name correct, is a news blogger that was covering Skylar's case closely. And he claimed that a cousin reached out to him and said that the girls disposed of the clothes in a lake with the family's knowledge. But this is just alleged and the person wished to remain anonymous. Yeah, they also stated that they possibly had gone back to the scene of the crime several times and moved Skylar's body around. Now, Skylar was initially considered by law enforcement authorities to be a runaway, and an Amber Alert was not immediately issued in connection with her disappearance. Now, this was pretty gross because the police officer who originally reviewed the surveillance footage said something to the effect of, oh, Skylar probably ran off with some guy. And so the police just did not take this seriously at first. But the nieces knew their daughter didn't run away because her cell phone charger, toothbrush, contact lens kit, and even her special blanket were still in her room. Skylar also missed her morning shift at Wendy's, something she had never done before. They actually knew that this was a big deal because Wendy's called them to see if she was coming into work. Thankfully, her parents were very insistent on the matter, and I think that's why this case moved along quicker than it could have based on the police just being lazy about it. An early tip indicated that Skylar had been seen in North Carolina, but the Star City Police Department determined that that person that was spotted was not Skylar. During this time, Skylar's parents began to distribute missing persons flyers about their missing daughter. So later that day, Sheila actually called the nieces, and according to Mary, quote, she proceeded to tell me that her, Skylar, and Rachel had snuck out that night before, and they had driven around Star City and were getting high and that the two girls had dropped her back off at the house. The story was that they had dropped her off at the end of the road because she didn't want to wake us up sneaking back in, end quote. And as the investigation went on, Sheila would contact the nieces almost daily for updates on Skylar's case. Not only that, she would make these posts on social media, going back and forth with the nieces saying how much she missed Skylar, how much she wanted information, she wanted her to come home. I can't believe you're doing this to me. You're my best friend. Why haven't you called me? She even went over to the niece's house and cried on Skylar's bed with her mother. Sheila was also interviewed by the police and shared the same story. However, there was a big discrepancy. Sheila stated that she had dropped Skylar off at midnight, but the surveillance footage from Skylar's apartment complex clearly shows Sheila's car picking Skylar up at 1230 a.m. 
The FBI and West Virginia State Police joined the search for Skylar on September 10th, 2012 and began interviewing her classmates at University High School. It should also be noted in the original police report, after reviewing the surveillance footage, the police could not even recognize that that was Sheila's car. They had actually written it down that she got into an SUV. And we have some of the footage right here, and I do not think this looks like an SUV. It's very clearly a sedan. Yeah, I don't think it looks like an SUV at all. Also, they went to interview Rachel as well, and she was really, really hesitant to talk to them. So after the murder took place, she actually went to like a Bible camp for a week, and she talked to him a little bit then, but wouldn't get into it. And when she got home, they actually had to chase her down to get an interview. Rumors swirled that Skylar went to a house party and overdosed. Corporal Ronnie Gaskins, one of the investigators in the case, said that people told him that the teenager attended a party and died. Even some people alleging that people panicked and disposed of her body. There were even crazy rumors circulating that Skylar had robbed a bank in Blacksville and was on the run. This just shows what happens in high schools when people die or go missing. And it was proven that Skylar didn't even touch hard drugs, so it was kind of a crazy rumor. So... Star City Police Officer Jessica Colbank's instincts said otherwise on this. Quote, their stories were verbatim the same. No one's story is exactly the same unless it's rehearsed. Everything in my gut said that Sheila was acting wrong and Rachel was scared to death. End quote. But with no legitimate cause to make an arrest yet, the police had to keep investigating and the nieces had to endure an agonizing wait before the truth about their daughter would finally come out. Officer Colbank realized that the car and the security footage belonged to Sheila. Authorities cross-referenced surveillance footage from nearby businesses of that night. They found the same car on surveillance footage near a convenience store in Blackstone, West Virginia, west of Star City in Morgantown. However, both Sheila and Rachel had said they went east on the night of Nisa's disappearance, and thus the girls were caught in a lie. Unfortunately, Officer Colbank was removed from the case after a confrontation with Sheila's mother, where Officer Colbank called her a tool. So there, Bean, it's comfy. So Christopher Berry, who was a state trooper assigned to the case in August of 2012, always believed that any murderer could not conceal what they had done for very long, which is very true. And in some cases, Barry had seen the murderers would even brag about their deeds. He had a feeling that this was one of those cases and thus believed that Rachel and Sheila would in time come to confess. State Trooper Barry created a fake online persona as an attractive teenage boy who attended West Virginia University in Morgantown and scoured Facebook and Twitter, linking up with other girls. Then investigators could use this access to glean insight on the mental states of Sheila and Rachel from their posts on social media. I mean, this reads kind of creepy, but I guess it was effective in this case. Investigators observed that Sheila was perky, while Rachel was reserved and quiet online. Neither of the girls hinted that they were upset about their best friend's disappearance outside the stuff that Sheila started to post later. Sheila would tweet mundane things and even posted photos of her and Rachel together. Eventually, Sheila's tweets became strange and cryptic, some of which even alluded to the killing. For example, she made a few tweets that stated something to the effect of, we really did go on three. Yes, that was probably the most damning one in my opinion. Meanwhile, Sheila and Rachel began hearing things on social media that made them nervous. Some people on Twitter outright accused them of having committed the murder and told them it was only a matter of time before they would get caught. Authorities continually brought Sheila and Rachel in for the interviews. Over time, the two became more secluded from their other friends and relied more on each other. And at some points, the nieces actually started calling them out on social media as well. Yes. So the stress and the strain of concealing their crime continued to take its toll on Rachel and Sheila. And on December 28, 2012, a frantic parent called 911. And that parent was actually Patricia Shove, Rachel's mother. And we have the footage and we'll play it for you now. Rachel was primed to confess and authorities picked her up for questioning. She was transported to mental health facilities where she stayed for five days and was banned from seeing Sheila. Soon, she told them the horrifying truth about Skylar Niece's murder. The motivation Rachel gave for the murder was that they didn't like her, 
and didn't want to be friends with her anymore. Skylar's father, David, stated that these two girls were among his daughter's best friends and that Sheila had even helped the family by distributing missing persons flyers. After her confession, Rachel led investigators to Skylar's body, which was covered in snow and couldn't be immediately recovered. She wasn't also immediately arrested and wore a wire whilst visiting Sheila. However, no information regarding Skylar was discussed. On March 13, 2013, U.S. Attorney William J. Illenfeld II issued a press release stating that a body was found in Wayne Township, Greene County, Pennsylvania on January 16, 2013 and had been identified as the body of Skylar Niece. Her body was found less than 30 miles away from her home. Skylar's postmortem examination revealed more than 50 stab wounds. The girls were promptly arrested. At the time, Sheila was at the Cracker Barrel with her mother. It should be noted, the girls went about their lives during this time. Eventually, they were homeschooled, but they knew that they had a body. They knew what had been done because there was confession, and they didn't immediately pick them up. They just let them live their lives out in the world. It really makes no sense. I'm not sure if they were trying to get more evidence that they could convict these girls, but it felt like to me they already had more than enough. Like it really made it so they could flee. One of the detectives when interviewed talked about how he didn't consider Rachel to be a reliable narrator and thought that she could have just been lying about killing Skylar. So they wanted to make sure. Yeah, it was really crazy because their stories had changed a few times. They at one point had said they had dropped her off in Blackstone. And I think they were going for the angle that Skylar had possibly done this robbery and was on the run. And when they interviewed the other one, I think Sheila was first and then Rachel was second. The story was identical. On May 1st, 2013, Rachel pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. According to court transcript, Rachel said that she and Sheila picked up Skylar and Sheila's car. The girls drove to Pennsylvania, got out of the car, and began socializing. At a prearranged time, Rachel and Sheila stabbed Skylar to death. The teens attempted to bury her body but were unable to do so and instead covered the body with branches. The court transcript indicates that other students overheard conversations between Rachel and Sheila about the murder plot, but failed to report it, thinking that they were joking. I believe they even told Skylar about this plot, and she didn't think that they could do that to her. It's just insane. So according to Rachel's plea agreement, she pled guilty to murder in the second degree by unlawfully, feloniously, willfully, maliciously, and intentionally causing the death of Skylar niece by stabbing her and causing fatal injuries. In the plea agreement, the state of West Virginia recommended a sentence of 20 years of incarceration. Rachel's family issued a public apology for her actions through their lawyer. On September 4, 2013, West Virginia prosecutors publicly identified Sheila as the second alleged perpetrator of the murder of Skylar and announced that she would be tried as an adult. Sheila was indicted by a grand jury on September 6, 2013 on one count of kidnapping, one count of first-degree murder, and one count of conspiracy to commit murder. She pleaded not guilty. The date of the trial was originally set for January 28, 2014. Facing the prospect of additional charges from the Pennsylvania authorities, Sheila pled guilty to first-degree murder. She expressed no remorse, but was sentenced to life in prison with mercy. Under West Virginia law, she is eligible for parole in 15 years. Pennsylvania authorities did not file charges as per the plea deal. Following her guilty plea on May 1, 2013, Rachel received a sentence of 30 years in prison and will be eligible for parole after 10 years. Both women are incarcerated at the Lakin Correctional Center in Mason County. Dave and Nee says the two girls did not deserve leniency from the courts. Quote, they're both sickos and they're both exactly where they need to be, away from civilization, locked up like animals, because that's what they are. They're animals. End quote. The mourning father occasionally visits a tree in the woods in Pennsylvania decorated with photos of his only child, his beloved daughter, killed because of two jealous best friends. Quote, I wanted to take the horrible thing that happened here and try to turn it into something good. A place that people can come and remember Skylar and remember the good little girl that she was, and not the little beast that they treated her like. End quote. So you might wonder, why wasn't there an Amber Alert in this case? Well, Skylar's disappearance, according to police, did not meet the circumstances for an Amber Alert. And there's four of them, and I'll read them to you now. The person is believed to be abducted. The person is under 18. The person may be in danger of death or serious injury. 
there was sufficient information to indicate that the Amber Alert would be helpful. And this doesn't mean that we agree with this. I think an Amber Alert was necessary, but apparently police did not think so. So a waiting period of 48 hours had to elapse before a teenager could be considered missing. And a lot of times this is not true state to state. A West Virginia state legislator from the Neese Family Home District introduced a bill called Schuyler's Law to modify the West Virginia Amber Alert plan to issue immediate public announcements when any person under the age of 18 is reported missing and in danger, regardless of whether the person is believed to have been kidnapped. Opinion columns appeared in both West Virginia and national media in support of Schuyler's Law, some of which also acknowledge criticism and drawbacks of the legislation. On March 27, 2013, the West Virginia House of Delegates approved Schuyler's Law with a 98-0 to zero vote. On April 12, 2013, the West Virginia Senate unanimously passed the law, but made minor technical changes to the bill which the House of Delegates voted to accept the same day. West Virginia Governor Earl Ray Tomblin signed the legislation into law in May of 2013. Thank goodness that he did. Now, it should be noted that the nieces then filed a civil suit against the parents of Rachel and Sheila, claiming that the parents had responsibility in Skylar's murder. Now, this was never brought to court, but allegedly it was settled out of court for $5 million. If you appreciate this video, the best thing that you can do is watch it to the end, like, subscribe, share this video with someone that might like it. As many of you know, we have been taken out of suggested feeds, which has really hurt our growth because we chose to cover some key missing persons cases, and apparently YouTube did not like that, despite it getting a lot of views and being received very positively. So anything you can do to help us on that front means the world to us. We also have a very wonderful group of people that are supporting us on Patreon, so I'll put their names up right now. Also, if you hear any snarfing and snoring in the background, we do have Turkish visiting. He is a very happy old man. He is currently sitting on his little bed. He makes a lot of noises. So if you heard anything weird during this episode, it was Turkish. Also, special shout out to Levi, Cami, Holly, and Shaka, our highest tier Patreon supporters. There's their lovely pictures right now. And there's Halls and Dolls, Holly's Mask Store. We'll have the link to it down below. And if you too want to support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash the misery machine, you get access to all of our secret episodes, you get access to our secret Discord and Snapchat groups, and you may even get a postcard. Haunted one. Patreon.com slash the misery machine. And finally, I was a special guest this week on my friend David's podcast, Caffeinated CX. He also has a YouTube channel, and I will go ahead and link for you the episode down below. It's a recap of the ACS murders. But until next week. We love you. We love you. Bye. Bye.